Welcome. So I thought I'd start this lesson with a review of what we did in the last lesson. So we learned about average rate of change. So if a function f is continuous on a closed interval a, b, then the average rate of change of f of x with respect to x is defined as the difference f of b minus f of a, or the difference in the y coordinates, divided by b minus a, difference in the, the x coordinates. So average rate of change is just a change in y divided by the change in x and is the slope of the secant line. Right? It's a line that connects two points on the curve. Instantaneous rate of change, if a function f is continuous on a closed interval a, b, then the instantaneous rate of change of f of x with respect to x at x equals c for some closed interval is defined as the limit of f of x minus f of c divided by x minus c, provided this limit exists. All right, so instantaneous rate of change is just, it's, the, it's called the difference quotient, it's the limit of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h as h approaches zero. So as it, since h is approaching zero, f of x plus h and f of x are as close as could possibly be. They're so close, there's no difference between them. And that's the slope of the tangent line. Tangent only intersects a curve at one point. We're going to be using instantaneous rate of change in this lesson as we learn about a new, con a new, a related, but new and related concept, and that is the derivative. Um, you're going to find in all of the lessons we do, um, all of the major concepts relate right back to limits. Everything we learn in calculus only exists because of limits, right? So limits are the basis of everything in calculus, and that's an important concept to know. All right, so derivative, tangent lines, right? So we're going to be focusing on the tangent line, and we know that's our instantaneous rate of change. All right, so here I have a curve. Tangent line intersects the curve in only one place, right? So here in our diagram here, P is the point of intersection. The slope of the tangent line gives the rate of change at that one point, i.e. the instantaneous rate of change. You want to know not what's happening over a time interval, but what's happening right now. All right, so slope of a curve and tangent lines. So here we have three, three curves, right? And we're zooming in on P. Oops, let's spell that correctly. We're zooming in on point P. What happens to our curve as we zoom in on, on point P, we get closer and closer to that particular point. Right? Notice what's happening here to our, our curve. Do you notice the curve is kind of flattening out? Right? So as we zoom in on point P, the closer we zoom in on point, on point P, right on the other side of this. The more that the function is approximated by a line. So do you notice our function is looking more and more like a line as we get closer and closer? And that particular line, that's our tangent line. Right? So just want you kind of see that even though we have a curve there, as we get closer and closer, we just zoom in on just that point, notice we start to become like a line. And we can find the slope of our, of our function. So we're going to learn how to uh, uh, do differentiation. We're going to learn how to differentiate 
using limits of different quotients. Right? So we're going to take what we learned with instantaneous rate of change and we're going to apply it to some more problems. And we're going to learn a little, we're going to learn about instantaneous rate of change a little bit more deeply. All right, so the slope of the tangent line at x, f of x, right, so x is our x coordinate, f of x is our y coordinate, is, so now we have a new symbol here. Do you see the f with a little line there, right? So this is, that's read as, that mark there is a prime, and so this is read as f prime of x, and that's notation for the derivative. And you might wonder, what's a derivative? In just three words, your derivative equals rate of change. That's the big idea for the derivative, is a rate of change. My V looks a little funky there. Deriv derivative. There. That looks a little bit nicer. All right, so our limit, our, our limit of our, um, the limit that we used for instantaneous rate of change, right? So the limit is also the instantaneous rate of change of f of x at x. So all that you learned for instantaneous rate of change, guess what? It's your derivative, right? So we're going to use the formula for instantaneous rate of change of f of x at x to find the derivative. And we're going to be able to solve a whole lot of problems. So let's take a look here what this all means, right? This, this formula here. So we have a diagram, and all of this is also in your notes as well. Um, you should add, anytime I write something down, uh, you should write that down too, because it's probably important. Especially if you have the picture in your notes. But here, you notice, we have a point P. Right? And so P here is, some, is an X value I'm interested in. Right? So this right here is my X value. Right, so if I'm over here, right, that's a pretty big difference between my two points. Right? There's x and, oops, I meant to make that h subprime. This is h subprime 1. Right, so that's pretty far away. Right, so what if I want to be a little closer? Well, you know, the closer you get, the better your secant line approximates the tangent line. I'm going to write that down. The closer two points the better that the secant line oops that's an L secant line uh, not line I'm trying to write so carefully so that you can read it if I move it down just a, a wee bit will it move? no why is it anytime I want to move something the something I did not want to move that's what moves there we go. All right, so the closer two points are together, the better that the secant line approximates the tangent line. That's really what a secant line is, what our average rate of change is. It approximates our tangent line. If the points are closer and closer together, the closer the points get together, right, the better the approximation. All right, so here we have h subscript, subscript 3, right? That's, that would be better. And you saw a diagram, right, where, we, where I connected the points in the last lesson, right? So that's not as close. That's not as good an approximation. Oops. Almost made the line. Let's try that again. That's not as, the, so the first one's not as good approximation as, let's try and do it. The second one is, let's bring that down a bit. Probably should use a line tool, huh? 
And that in the third one here where the points are a little closer, that's better. And then if I use these points instead, notice that's even better. Right? So the closer the two points are together, the better the secant line approximates the tangent line. And now what if that distance goes to zero? Right? There's no distance at all between my two points. That's our instantaneous rate of change, and that's also our derivative, and that's our tangent line. They're all the same thing. Isn't that good? All right, so differentiation, uh, differentiation using limits of difference quotients. So for a function, y equals f of x, its derivative at x is the function defined by, it's going to be the limit of f, of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h as h, uh, as h goes to 0, provided the limit exists. Right? right now, you don't have to worry about, does the limit exist? Does it not exist? Right? We're going to learn when it exists and when it doesn't exist. Right? And um, a limit is, so a function isn't going to not have a limit at all anywhere. Right? So sometimes our derivative exists. It's for some points. And then sometimes for other points, we don't have a derivative. We're going to learn when we're going to have a derivative and when we're not going to have a derivative. And you're going to be able to, to be able to tell that. And we're actually going to learn that in this lesson. All right, so if f prime of x exists, then we say that f is differentiable at x. So when we're talking about differentiability, we're looking at a particular point because every function is differentiable somewhere. Right? But sometimes some functions aren't differentiable everywhere. And we're going to learn when functions are going to be differential everywhere and uh, what functions are not going to be differential everywhere. Okay? So here we have our tangent line. So now the difference between f of x and h is 0. Right? So now there's no difference. And that's our tangent line. And our um, difference quotient, our limit of our difference quotient, is going to help us find something about our tangent line. Can you guess what it's going to help us find? Think about two features of a line. And I'm going to tell you in a moment. All right, so differentiation using limits of difference quotients. We're going to do this in four simple steps. Right? It really is four simple steps. Even sometimes um, they'll, you know, some steps take a little longer than others, but the steps aren't really that complicated. All right, so we can do this in four steps. We're going to compute f of x plus a. And actually, it says four. I have it in four steps, but quite honestly, we can do this in one step. So one step, look at that. Now it's, only, now it's only two steps. right? So we can combine those three into one step. We can compute f, f of x plus h, and we can form the difference f of x plus h minus f of x. And we can form the quotient f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. right? And then, or actually, we can do the fourth one too, all in one step. The only extra step is when we want to evaluate. Then we do have to do that as a separate step. All right, so the derivative of a function is going to be another function. All right, so when we find our, um, our derivative, when we take the limit of our difference quotient, what we're going to get is another function. All right, we're not going to get a number. Well, I shouldn't say that. Sometimes we'll get a number, but that number is still a function. Right? It's always a function. All right, so just remember that's very, very important. Let's put a little star next to that. The derivative of a function is another function. I think we should find the derivative pretty soon. I think we're going to do that on the next page. Um, this is in your notes. Uh, so we're going to be doing a lot of applied problems. First, you have to learn how to find the derivative. Right? But then we're going to be doing a lot of applied problems. Right? Calculus is very much about solving real world problems. Um, We've been focusing on tools, but now we're going to be able to get right into the meat of it and solve some real world problems. All right, so uh, f prime of x, which is the derivative, equals the limit as h approaches 0, f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. It represents all of these things. 
right? And you need to know it represents all of these things. So let's put next to it, I'm going to put next to it in red. Must know. All right, so it's the slope of the tangent line. It's instantaneous rate of change. It's marginal cost, revenue, or profit. And instantaneous velocity. So notice how many of these are real-world problems. And the slope of the tangent line, if it's in context, instantaneous rate of change in context is also going to be a real-world problem. All right, so now let's find the derivative using the difference quotient. All right, so we have f of x equals 2x squared minus 3x plus h. All right, so I'm going to write on the side here the, the formula. You, you don't have to write it because you've got it, you know, on that same page in your notes, right? But just to help us remember, I'm going to put it over here. All right, so it's the limit as h approaches 0, f of x plus h minus f of x all divided by h. Right? So now, everywhere we see an x, for the first part, we're going we're gonna to substitute x plus h. Right? So we have, so now, don't write f of x, by the way. This is the derivative. Write f prime of x, right? So this is the derivative. So we're finding the derivative. I gave you the original function. All right, so f prime of x is equal to the limit as h approaches 0, 2 times x plus h squared minus 3 times x plus h plus 1. And I like to use, it's not so important that the first part's in parentheses, but it's really important that you put the second part in parentheses, or you know what's going to happen? I, I almost guarantee you, it's somebody is not going to remember to distribute that negative. If I don't put the parentheses, you know who the somebody who isn't going to remember to distribute the negative is? It's probably going to be me, all right? So I always put the parentheses. It's just very easy to forget to distribute. You know, you're just kind of focused on solving, and then you do all the hard stuff, and then you're wrong. You make a mistake because you forgot to distribute a negative. The simplest little thing, all right? So we're subtracting our function there. And this is all divided by h. So on these problems, it really helps if you remember what x plus h squared is. You, you remember the patterns. I mean, if not, you can do it off to the side. You can um, expand it and make it x plus h times x plus h. Or you can just do it in your head. But what I don't want to see, do, do not ever say that x plus h squared, all squared, is x squared plus h squared. Because it is not. And I will cry. I will cry if you get that one wrong. All right, and so 2 times x squared plus... Right, so if you remember the, the rule, right, I'd have an x plus h times an x plus h. So I'd have x times h and x times h. This will be 2xh. And then plus h squared. Minus, we'll distribute the negative uh, 3 here, uh, minus 3x minus 3h. I can drop the parentheses. Uh, uh, yeah, drop the parentheses. So long as I remember to distribute the negative along with the 3. Then we have a plus 1. I'm going to get rid of these parentheses too, uh, the second set of parentheses. I'm just going to distribute the negative. So this is going to be minus 2x squared. This is going to be plus 3x. And this is going to be minus 1. And all of that divided by h. See, so I did say like in the begin the, on the last slide. So th there, you know, there's a lot to the steps. But you can see that the steps are not that complicated. Oh, and by the way, let's go back to the list of steps, and you can see how we did 1, 2, and 3 all in the same step. So compute f of x plus h. Form the difference f of x plus h minus f of x. Form the quotient f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. And compute f prime of x. And you can see that this was all done in the very first step. It's all right here. All I'm doing now is simplifying. Right? So it takes more than one step. Right? But you can, in one step, you can do all of that and have your equation. Right? There's, no needs, there's no reason or no need to do each part of that separately, but I want to make sure you know that you knew that all of those parts need to go together when you're finding the derivative. All right? So now we have f prime of x equals, now I'm just going to distribute a little old 2 and then combine some little old terms. All right, so we have 2x squared plus 4xh plus 2h squared minus 3x minus 3h 
plus 1 minus 2x squared plus 3x minus 1. All right, now, so the first thing you want to do is make sure you simplify and get rid of parentheses. I'm going to write that right here. So I'll put it right here. You want to simplify and eliminate parentheses before you do anything else. Right? So notice that I didn't deal with anything else other than simplifying and eliminating my parentheses. I didn't go around saying, oh, hey, the, I can combine these two. I can combine those two. Just get everything simplified and then combine terms all at once. <laughs> all right, so now I can combine the like terms. And before I do that, I need the other half of my fraction here. Boop. All right, so I'm going to cross off things that would just cancel themselves out. Notice there's a plus 1 and there's a minus 1. That's gone. There's a negative 3x and a positive 3x. That's gone. Uh, there is a 2x squared and a negative 2x squared. That's gone. And that's it. So now I have f prime of x equals the limit as h approaches 0 4xh plus 2h squared minus 3h. Notice there's something you can factor out of all of those terms. Right? If you get to this point and you can't simplify it so that you can plug in the um, 0 for h, just know you've made an error somewhere. I don't know what the error is. It could be a distribution error. It could be an addition error. Uh, it could be just the simplest little, simplest little thing. Right? But if you get to this point and you can't factor something out so that you're going to be able to plug in 0 for h, just go back and look at your steps somewhere you've made an error. It happens to all of us. You just make a silly little error, and then you can't simplify. All right, so f prime of x is equal to the limit as h approaches 0. We're going to factor out the h, get the h out of there. And we got a 4x plus 2h minus 3 all over h. So notice that we can cancel. Right, and so now I've got. And do notice that we have not dropped the limit. Do not drop a limit anywhere in this, all right? Otherwise, you have an inaccuracy. You have what's called a congruence error, <coughs> a linkage error, all right? So this is not the value of the function we're finding. We're finding a limit. And so we need to have limit in there, right? I would also, also have um, f prime of x in there as well. This is an equation. It's a function. You need to write it in function notation, right? Don't, don't make um, errors in terms of your derivative for silly little things like um, not correctly notating it. All right, so now I'm going to plug in. So notice now I'm not writing the word limit anymore, right? Because now I'm plugging in. As soon as I go to substitute in, I can drop the limit. All right, so I have 4x plus 2 times 0, right? Because I'm plugging in 0 for h, because it's the limit as h approaches 0, minus 3. I don't care whether you write 4x plus 2h minus 3 all by itself and then substitute in. All right? I think you can see the h's are canceled and it's 4x plus 2h minus 3. All right? So it's fine to substitute in at this point. All right, so now notice that one of those is 0. Um, so I can simplify that. I have f prime of x is equal to 4x minus 3. And that is our derivative. We have cut, we've used our, um, our difference quotient to find our derivative. And you do need to be able to calculate your derivative using a limit of difference quotients. Right? So here, verse 1. And you might be thinking, OK, we've got an equation there. What does that mean? We'll talk more about that uh, very short, uh, shortly. Right? Um, but first, let's do a little bit more practicing with just finding the derivative. Right? At any point, if you don't understand the steps, please ask me. If something doesn't make sense to you, have me explain it to you. All right? Let's do another one. And now we're going to evaluate. And then I'm going to tell you what you just found. All right, so f of x equals x squared. We want to find, it's really hard to see that because it's, it's kind of lost in the, in the f there. Um, but it is a prime symbol up there. So f prime of x, so that means the derivative. And we're going to use the difference quotient. And then we're going to find f prime of negative 3 and f prime of 4. So we have f prime of x is equal to the limit 
as h approaches 0. And I'll write it over here. Like I said, you don't have to write it because it's right there in your notes. Um, but this way, while you're listening to me, you can remember what the equation is. There we go. All right, so we have the limit as h approaches 0. And all i got to do now is plug in x plus h for the, for the x squared there. I, I have no problem with you doing this, the, the, all those three steps all at one time, just setting up your equation. Right? So you're going to plug in x plus h, and then you're going to plug in the x, right? All right? So you're just plugging the x plus h and the x in for whatever your function is. Right? So it's just going to be your function evaluated at x plus h minus the function all over h. All right, so now we'll just square. This one's not too difficult at all. So we have the limit as h approaches 0. That's going to be, remember from the last slide, x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus x squared all over h. Right? And then have nothing else to do right now except notice the fact, because we got rid of our parentheses already, that those are going to cancel each other out because they are opposites. So now we have f prime of x is equal to the limit as h approaches 0 of 2xh plus h squared all divided by h. Let's factor out h. So f prime of x is equal to the limit as h approaches 0. We're factoring out h. We'll have 2x plus h divided by h. That cancels. And now we'll just plug in. Right? So I'm going to write it down here. f prime of x equals the limit as h approaches, as, not x approaches 0, h approaches 0. h approaches 0. And 2x plus h. And now if we plug in 0, we would just have 2x plus 0, which is 2x. All right? And so that is, let me not be sloppy here. Surely I shouldn't use a chain of, of equal signs f prime of x is 2x plus 0, f prime of x is 2x. All right, so now we're going to evaluate. We're going to find f prime of negative 3 right, and f prime of 4. So what would we do? We just plug it in, right, into 2x. So we have 2 times negative 3. Let me give myself a little bit of space here, which is just negative 6. Oh, and by the way, these are all in your notes. I'm sure you could follow along, though, right? And this is 2 times 4. So f prime of 4 is 8. And you're like, OK, got some numbers. No, I know what that means. I'm going to tell you. So let's, let's take a look at what that means, all right? The slope of, so f of x, remember, is the original function. That's our function. I should say original function because both, both, are, both the f of x and f prime of x are functions. All right, so this is our original function right here, f of x. This is the derivative. So this, I'm going to write f of x for the function. Right? So the slope of f of x equals negative 6 at x equals negative 3. If you wanted to know the precise point, you would just plug in negative 3 for the x in the original function. So if we plug in negative 3 into x squared, right? that would be negative 3 squared. So f prime of, oops, excuse me, I got used to writing f prime, f of negative 3 equals 9. So there's a point on the original function, that 3, 9, negative 3, 9. So the slope of f of x at, is equal to negative 6 at, so if you wanted to know the exact point, because it's a particular point, right? It's not just any old, you know, it's not for every single value of um, 
x equals negative 3 because our function only passes through negative 3 at one point, and that is, because it's a function, negative 3, 9. So the slope of our original function, f of x, is equal to negative 6 at that particular point, negative 3, 9. And that also means that the slope of f of x equals 8 at, all right, so 8 squared. I don't think I have to write it again, right? Oops. You know, in my head was the number 64. But my hand said, hey, let's write something else. Maybe I'm looking at the 2 and 4 right, right above it. All right, so the slope of f of x is equal to 8 at the particular point. Oh, sorry. Well, it really helps to plug in the right x value. This is 4. Let's rewind this and try again. So the slope of f of x is equal to 8 at, maybe I do need to plug it in, huh? 4, we plugged in 4 at 4, 16. Helps to look at the right numbers. So when we get, when we find our derivative and we evaluate, and I'll go through this again, but when we find the derivative and evaluate, we are finding the slope of the tangent line. I'll write that down because that's a big idea. When we find the slope of the, um, excuse me, when we evaluate, I almost forgot my thought. Can you tell us late? When we evaluate that derivative, we find the slope of the tangent line. at that point. I'll write and then I'll talk. All right, there we go. So when we evaluate for the derivative, we find the slope of the tangent line at that particular point. I think this is a good place to stop. Right? We'll be finding a lot more limits of different quotients in the next podcast. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.